giving you a voice, making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. 大家好，我是 Howard， 还有今天跟我来是四六一三从 Sydney, Australia. Hello, everyone. I'm Howard, and joining us today is forty six thirteen from Sydney, Australia. We have students Ben, Harry, Will, and Michael, and you guys have a very、uh, fun thing going on with your local reg- regulations with the coronavirus. Can you guys talk a little bit about that? Yep. So we've been doing a lot of testing here in New South Wales. I think it's thirty thousand a day, and we're only getting around ten cases. Each day, so the government regulations right now. We've been back at school for two months now, and we we don't have to require masks masks at the moment, which we're really are、uh, grateful for. So yeah, we've been we've been really diligent in following uh the social distance social distancing laws. Yeah. All right. With、uh, that, um, you gotta make sure we follow our local regulations、uh, concerning the coronavirus, and uh. Let's just jump right into the 2020 game. What were your first thoughts on the Infinite Recharge game? Um, well, I mean, it works a bit differently for us because of time zones. So, like, where most teams may, like watch it live, um, we're actually encouraged to like sleep through because it's like three three a.m. for us, and so we want us like think and like be able to like actually read the manual properly. Um, I don't think everyone on the team does that, but we're meant to, and at least I know I did because I was tired. Um, yeah, so. Um, yeah, so I felt thought the game was like when I read the manual, it was like it's very interesting game because like we I know I personally、um, haven't experienced a shooting game like on the team. I know like most our team hadn't because the last one was 2017, and the last one with elements similar to this was 2016. So for me, it was new in that aspect.、Um, I think it was a very interesting game in the sense that like whereas 2019. Was much more about a few placing a few pieces like on the rocket. This game, like to get all the ranking points that you need, was much more about like really fast cycle times, getting those balls into the goal. Um, the high one, I can't remember its name. Um, yeah, so it's much more like a focus on like speed. Um, sort of like in a way, the twenty seventeen shooting, and I feel like that was a different change. And also, I'd say like it was interesting the way they designed like competing priorities. So like, say with climbing, you'd want like a taller robot. But then to go into the trench, you need a shorter robot than for shooting as well. So like, it was interesting since they sort of like designed the game to like have competing objectives, like how best to design your robot. Um, yeah.、So. And then also on that, it was interesting how the drive stations were on the opposite side of where you could score most of your points, ah,、uh, which was something that we really had to consider, ah,、uh, because the sight lines, especially with the the hangar in the middle, it can kind of block out. What you can see. So we also that was something that really stood out for me in in this game. Yeah, so definitely a lot of、uh, differences over there in Australia.、Um, you know, it's the 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 release of the kickoff is meant to be for like a Eastern American coast time, and everyone else kind of just has to deal with it regardless of where they are.、Um, Do you guys see kind of like an advantage to like this? Like we're starting up at three a.m. Everyone when they come in to the shop, you know, they've already seen the game, they've already read the rules. Do you guys see like an advantage to that, or do you kind of see like, oh, we're kind of already waking up with one foot down compared to everyone else? Um, I can go as well. Um, I mean, I think the one advantage um it does give us is um well because the way we do it for us is um like on the first day. The students actually don't come in. Like you wake up, and you just read the rules, and so like what it means is like, well, yes, like sure, it buys people like a few hours maybe, um, but like for us, it means like we don't have to like, we don't like really communicate at that first section. So in some respects, it allows us to like independently like read the rules on our own rather than say all joining together. So it means like you can get like, independent ideas about strategy, um. Because like we're not all at the shop right when the game goes,、so、we all like we react together. We kind of react on ourselves and like read the rules, come up our own strategies, and then like merge. So in that respect, there's advantages and disadvantages. I'd say, but like, yeah. So on the first day, we normally make a table of I hope, well, I dream, I hope, I want, I can, and like I dreams like two five four twenty eighteen win undefeated the whole time, and you're. And then I hope is like a good goal for us that we, with enough time and development, we can get there. I want is like we 
want to have this no matter what. And then I can is this is the bare minimum we should do. And we all develop one independently. And then on the first day we come in, which is a Monday, we split up into teams, teams and we go through our lists and decide in small groups what uh, like a combined one is. And then we all come back later in the day and actually like put it all together, trying to get a rough strategy for the game and just working out maybe if we need to, what we start need to prototype in. Now, I do want to call out a little bit of the Northern Hemisphere versus Southern Hemisphere kind of a thing. You know, we're starting this competition in January, which is traditionally winter in the, we'll call it Northern Hemisphere. For you guys, this is like summer. Do you guys, you guys feel like, man, summer, I don't have class. I can do this more. Or do you guys see it as, oh, I got to drain my personal time and possibly time I could be studying for exams? Uh, well, we start in our school holidays and we normally have about three weeks before school starts up. And that's our big summer holiday block. So there's no real studying needed between years. So that will be transitioning from like year 11 to year 12 or year 10 to 11 for most people in the team. So we're normally all here focused because we are all good friends. And then, but when school starts up, we really slow down. And that's just because we're not used to, because we're used to working the holidays where we can come in pretty much every day. But then school comes up and we're all focused on school. So it has its advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, I mean, actually, one nice thing about the summer, our robotics, is robotics has fantastic air conditioning. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, like, I know it was quite funny when I took, like, a photo of, like, like all the programmers. And I think, like, everyone, like, jumpers on in jeans and, like, jackets. And, like, outside, it was, like, 40 degrees Celsius. Um, so, like, over 100 <laughs> Fahrenheit. So, you go outside and, and like, it's crazy. But inside, everyone's, like, jackets hunkered down in, like, the Arctic air conditioning. So, yeah, it's quite nice to come down and just cool down. But, man, my, my personal experience is the opposite. I'll get there. There's no snow on the ground. And then when I'm trying to leave, it's like, what road has been plowed? <laughs> <laughs> um, so just to kind of circle back a little bit, you know, I really do admire this idea of, you know, uh, students are at home reading the rules and kind of coming to the team already having this understanding and knowledge of the game. Whereas I'm somewhat dealing with a, uh, a student or a mentor has a great idea and then 15 minutes later, we find out we can't do it because there's this rule that we didn't see yet that invalidates that strategy. So I, I do see huge value in having everyone read the rules on their own before uh, bringing it all together. So with that, let's kind of move on to kind of, and we already touched on this a little bit, is how does your team itself do kickoff? You know, how do you guys gather everyone or kind of get those discussions going from kickoff? Well, it's pretty much what I touched on earlier. Like we come in with our plans from reading the rules the day before and we all join in a lecture theater that we have at the school and we split up into groups, mainly led by student mentors that have just finished. So the seniors, I believe, and they lead the group discussion, but we always try and make sure the younger students get their voice first so that we can get their ideas without overpowering them. And then once, and I think we get, two to three hours for that. And we normally come up with different strategies for each of our categories that we decide on. And then we come back and meet together and decide on a overall strategy that we should do. And I think that's normally the first day. Yeah. So then after, after that first day, I think uh, depending on how effectively we work, it's around two to three days. We decide what is the most important aspect of our robot should be. Um, and th for the past two years, uh, that has been Climber. Uh, so then what we do is we split up our team. Like we take a couple of students to first prototype that and then other, and then the rest of the strategy team will continue to strategize about other elements that should be in our robot. So I, I do want to call out this kind of a uh, Northern Southern hemisphere thing. You, you guys said uh, seniors um, gen generally and kind of where I'm from, you know, every every student stays in that same grade for the entirety of the season. You guys kind of have this like, you know, promotion graduation in the middle. How do those who just graduated participate or do they not participate? 
Um, so typically with students that have just graduated, they'll be going to a university or college right after. So sometimes for them, it might be a bit difficult for them to rejoin the team. But um, the students who seem really dedicated to robotics and really enjoy it um, do typically come back and help to join and help the team. So we'll have them um, helping the younger students to develop their own ideas because although we won't have them there all the time because they'll be doing their own university and schooling, um, it's very helpful to, to have them around as experienced students who can help like the younger ones who need um, help with developing ideas and just understanding the game in general. So I just want to make sure kind of people understand this reference of um, this is kind of the first team we've done that's from the Southern Hemisphere. Everyone else has been Northern. I've lived in the Northern Hemisphere of the planet for the, my entire life. So uh, just kind of hearing the differences that FIRST has across the globe is, is quite fascinating to see how everyone deals with just the build season and onward. And um, we spoke a little bit kind of about the first week and kind of how you guys break into groups, but how do you guys plan out the build season? I know we kind of moved away from the uh, uh, stop build day, but kind of how do you guys go from like week one, two, three, and so on? Um, so I think this year, although we had no stop build day, we still kind of like aimed for the, to have a robot done by stop build day because like it's still a great goal to have a complete robot by that time because even if you didn't have a competition, like having a complete robot by then allows you time to c keep adjusting that and gives your drivers time to acclimatize to the robot. Um, typically, the first three weeks of the build season, we are on holidays. So we get like six days a week all day to just come into robotics and we try and work as much as we can so that when we're back at school, we have less to do. So then um, we can just be adjusting our robot by the time we're back at school. I mean, yeah, so basically our goal, like, while we're on holidays is to get, like, just, like as much done as possible. Um, but, like, in that, like, if you break down those three weeks, as the first day we said it's, like, much about strategy, like, coming up with an idea for how you want to play the game. And then we kind of spend, like, three days or so, like, doing prototyping. Um, so that's, like, trying out, like, say, we know how you want to play the game, but, like, what mechanisms do we want to do that? Because when we do our, like, strategy... We typically think of the robots like a magic box almost. So we don't worry about how you're actually like going to get it done, but like what we want to do strategically. And then we spend three days thinking mechanically, how do we actually do that? So we spend like three days like prototyping. And then we like get into um after that, we then meet together, discuss prototypes, and discuss like what's our best way forward based on what we've done. And then we go like into like splinter sub teams. Um like so you have different mechanical sub teams and then programming team. Um, and then like, mechanical sub teams kind of all work on like their main aspects. You might have like a shooting team, like a drive based team, um, that type of stuff. And they all work and keep prototyping, keep improving their aspect for like those three weeks. And then once we go back, we kind of just keep working, keep prototyping, um, kind of till the season ends, really. Because like our goals have like a robot done like by six weeks, but especially with no bag day anymore, the season doesn't really stop until like the end of champs so it just keep improving until we can't improve anymore because we don't have any games to play so yeah i i think that's a good uh segue about talking with prototypes can you, can you guys talk about some of the prototypes you guys made this year yeah so i think the majority of our prototyping this year went into our shooter because the majority of students on the team hadn't built a shooter before so that was something new that we had to go into um, typically, when we start designing prototypes for the year, we'll start with an MDF wood and we'll design a very simple design, which we can just test like a simple design such as a flywheel or just a single wheel over the top. So that's how we started our shooting prototyping this year. We developed two different shooters and then um, tried to progress those just using like simple materials so that it would be quick and easy to produce those and test them in time so that then we could develop a proper shooter for the game um, quickly. Uh, do you guys find that when you guys prototype it with this MDIF wood, that it's kind of like a one-to-one -one translation, or is there kind of also more fine-tuning that has to happen, or is it kind of just the nature of learning something here before building it later? I think definitely with the wood, it's just to test like the very basic theory of a system because 
um, typically using the wood, it's very clunky. It's it's not designed how we want it to be, but it's just like to get the base idea out there so we can compare two ideas. Um, it's not typically to test like the exact um, advantages and disadvantages of a system. So at the start of the season, when we developed the two shooters in the wooden types, um, we saw that the single wheel shooter with just one on the top, which fed the ball through like a ramp on the top, it was much more accurate in like when we shot five in a row compared to a flywheel shooter. Um, and this was due to having like the two separate motors on the flywheel shooter, which may or may not have been synchronized. Um, so that um, prototyping actually helped us to decide to just use the single wheeled shooter um, rather than a flywheel shooter, which may have had more power, but was much less accurate. So I want to kind of ask about this organization of this. Is it just like a single team making a bunch of prototypes or are you guys splitting into multiple teams making multiple prototypes of the same thing or different things? Yeah, so in 2018 with our robot that was very small, we decided we would go the elevator route and also we wanted to try out the shooter. So we set two sub teams into those categories and one did elevator and one did shooter. Similarly, with the intake, we had an, one type of intake, I think, was the sides. And then one from our FT, FTC experience in the year before, we tried a top-down one. So we split up to try and work out which one will be better and then evaluate after, I think, later in the week. Okay, so that's a bunch of prototyping. Let's talk a little bit about software now. How do you guys uh, organize your software? How do you guys do the code? And how do you guys do autonomous? Right, yes. Um, so I'll go to the first part of your question, like how they like, organize um, the code and team that stuff. So we have like one software like team. We don't have like several sub, sub teams like some teams do, like the scouting stuff. And typically um, the way it works like with this team is we heavily use like version control to keep track of our, of our code. And so like if someone's working on a feature, they'll have a branch for that feature. And then when they're done, like say getting it close enough, then they like merge into like our master branch. And then like say like a programming captain, or, like a mentor, someone will then read their code and make sure like, like they like have format correctly, it makes sense. It's like logically structured. And then if that's the case and they test and it works, then we'll all combine it. And so like we had like, oh, I think the highest was like 10 branches at once, which is a bit chaotic, but like, cause all the code is all, all different features all coming together. Um, yeah, and so every, yeah. Um, in terms of how we did autonomous, um, so it's changed throughout the throughout the years. Um, so like in earlier years, it was like fairly simple, like say more like time-based stuff. However, as we advanced, um, we got more complex. Like in 2017, um, we had like some sort of curve system we did generated um, using Bayesian curves. Um, so basically like we would follow like a path almost. <laughs> Um, like around, we had like a graphic, so we could UI, we could like design where we want to go in the field and kind of follow those paths. Um, however, like as this later seasons went on, like that was less useful for us because like 2018 was much more like straight lines you kind of want in the field. And 2019, because the um, platform, you kind of jumped off the platform, it meant it was much harder to be like accurate, know where you were in the field. So we much more aligned, like say vision say like aligning based on targets, going and following targets. Um, this year, um, our big focus um, for Autonomous was kind of like knowing where we were on the field um, in a much more like serious sense than we did in previous years. Because in previous years, it was kind of like the way Autonomous works is be like, you kind of follow a line. So you'd be like, what's my heading? Uh, you say you set your heading, the robot wants to go at, so you want to go like zero degrees. And then you kind of go like, um, see if not zero degrees, then adjust be on zero degrees. But like, if you went off that path, so I say you bump something or like, yeah, or you weren't quite accurate or say only wheels slightly like, turned. And so you're, you're like trailed off slightly. It wouldn't actually adjust that. So this year we worked on like doing like tracking where we wouldn't feel like odometry type stuff. Um, and so like using vector's addition to like, we basically worked out like, well, Here's where we are on the field at any point in time. Here's our velocity, our acceleration. And we know what other corner on the field we're trying to go to. So the robot will work out, right, if I'm here, I need to go to that point in the field. I'm going to kind of motion profile our way over there. So that's probably a bit more complex than you wanted. But um, yeah, that's kind of how we changed over the years. And that's what we're doing this year. And I'll just jump in quickly. Mechanically, 
for we normally try and put a center encoder in the middle of the robot to give the programmers the ability to try and track and create those straight lines. Yeah, so that was like, it's very helpful. Yeah, thanks, kind of cool. I, I really do love how you guys are kind of building on top of what you've done in previous seasons. And it's not just a, we just want to drive straight, just want to drive straight. Um, and some teams, you know, they, they struggle driving straight, but we'll help them out too. Um, so what would you guys say were like the priority marks this year for Autonomous? Um, right. So this year, I think the priority was just, honestly, it was just like getting as many balls as we could in the goal. And was, I think our priority was the inner goal, um, because like the huge point advantage. So, um, basically our focus was like getting there, like getting within line of shooting as fast as possible and like being able to shoot as fast as possible. So a big part of that was working like our shooting algorithms because like in 2016, um, like our shooting algorithm, we didn't have to be quite as fast. So it was quite a slow system. Um, like the, the tr like stabilizing the tracking was very slow. And then like in 2017, our solution was just basically to park ourselves next to the shooter, um, next to the boiler. Whereas this game, we had to shoot from different positions and shoot quite fast. So our priority for autonomous, while it was like knowing where we're on the field, um, the biggest priority was definitely like being able to basically center where we were on the field and like point and shoot as fast as possible and like get that time down to shoot so we could get as many points as we could in the 15 seconds so yeah timing is very important and you only got 15 seconds to really figure things out so let's kind of flip back to mechanical what were the overall mechanical goals on building the robot you guys have already kind of spoke about shooting you know what were kind of like i want it to be this fast i want it to be this tall or you guys want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think we started off the season pretty ambitious. We wanted like a robot with lots of very difficult and complicated mechanisms, and we still wanted it to go under the trench. Um, I think throughout the season, that decision definitely changed as we developed our mechanisms and found out things such as they're very tall. Um, but, you know, throughout the season, we started, um, we wanted like a light, fast robot so that we could obviously do the cycles and get the ranking points, which we wanted for the game. Um, but then we also wanted to balance that with like a robot that would um, help our teammates um, because we can't always rely on having um, proficient teammates. All right. So that's kind of the mechanical goals. Uh, and unfortunately, you guys didn't compete this season. But uh, what would you guys do at the regional if you had gone? Like, what would be your overall game strategy? Yeah, I'll hire you. Um, so our strategy was to try and overload the opposition's human player. I think that was played out in some of the Israel district regionals. So our goal would be to get as many balls as we can possible and shoot them into the upper uh, upper goal. And then because of the maximum balls you were allowed to hold in your in your, like, drive station... Uh, the human player would have to feed out the balls directly to us, and then we could just pick up those balls and shoot them again. So that was really our main strategy. But of course, you know, that couldn't always be done well. So we also had like backup strategies of driving back to our human player station and then shooting the balls as far as far away from the goal as possible. So we could just increase cycle times from both on our side of the field and also by staying uh, in the opposition's half of the field. Yeah, it's unfortunate we couldn't see you guys kind of compete live or at least recorded. So um, what, what have been your plans since, you know, coronavirus? Is what have you guys been doing? How have you guys been staying in touch and active? Um, so because we, we are like the seniors of the team and we're not going to be competing uh, next year, um, we haven't really been doing much personally, but the team itself has been still – being able to like make progress so we've been we've split up all of the like junior members of the team into different like sub teams and they all worked on designing a brand new robot to uh, face the challenges of this game so like us personally we haven't really been doing much uh, we were very we were very sad that we couldn't compete yeah. in our last year but you know life goes on but the overall team has like been able to pr progress out out uh, current robot that we were going to compete with but then also design like completely new uh, subsystems that we could implement for next year 
Yeah, because um, on that note, the Australian school system, especially our state, it's a bit brutal in terms of like your final years, like exams every other week almost. And they all count to get into the university because it's basically just a number. The number you get based on your exams is what you need to go to, um, what course you do. So that's why like you kind of have to start prioritizing your academics over your robotics. So that's why it's kind of like the end of the road for us. Um, however, like on that note, we've also done like heaps of workshops. Like I know every Friday is a programming workshop. Um, and those type of things because like it was about training the newer students because like we're all done. Like, but like you need to pass on as much knowledge as you can. So basically, we basically been working on a, a like improving our current robot and like improving our programming and like mechanical design while also training people on skills they'll need in the future for like newer games or next year so that they will be able to like do the best of their they can to like succeed in the game and challenge. Yeah, passing on that knowledge is definitely important. And I got like one final Australian culture question for you guys. Uh, what are your thoughts on Vegemite? I love it. Got to have it every morning before school. Vegemite gets me through the day, got to say. Yeah. Almost as good. It's better than Nutella. You just eat it out of a jar with a spoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, I was, I was like... I was going to say, I know a lot of people in America have peanut butter. I mean, I'm not really a big fan, but they put like a lot on their toast or whatever. I mean, that's not really what you're meant to do with uh, Vegemite. So I think that's really why Americans don't like it because they think, oh, you should just like cover the whole thing. No, you need to, you need to spread it out nice and evenly. It's, it's not Nutella. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't put it on thick. Otherwise, you're going you're gonna to have a bad day. Probably it's a bad like, week. You, really. Probably like the same amount you put in like pepper. Like that amount. <laughs> that amount of pepper you put on your toast is how much you put Vegemite on toast. <laughs> like, it's basically so the, the same thing. So for those watching, you should really try Vegemite at least once in your life. And uh, with that, I want to thank you all for uh, coming on. And uh, for those who are going to be watching live, stay tuned for the live show. And we'll see you in a little bit. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch, keeping fun loud, live, and independent.